uh, we have some important updates to detail uh, in relation to COVID-19 and our border controls. Firstly, overnight, Western Australia recorded no new cases of COVID-19. It's always a positive sign uh, that we don't record any new cases in our hotel quarantine system, uh, and it's very pleasing. I also want to thank all West Australians for their cooperation over the weekend as we reintroduced mandatory contact registers. The uptake of our Safe WA app has been incredible. It, it far exceeded our expectations and is a credit to everyone who has downloaded the app and has started to use it. As of 8 a.m. this morning, we have had more than 725,000 individual downloads of the app, plus more than 20,000 businesses are now using the app. Since the app came in on Saturday, Safe WA has recorded more than 1.1 million individual scan-ins. It is safe to say that Western Australians have embraced it, and I thank them for that. By using Safe WA, you are help keeping our state safe and strong. Understandably, when introducing something like this, there may be some minor issues initially, but overall, it has been a success, and it will continue to get easier to use as it becomes a regular part of our life while COVID-19 exists in the world. Obviously, we are here today to provide some clarity in our controlled border arrangements with New South Wales and Victoria. Just on our controlled interstate border, I can provide some updated numbers I've received from WA Police. Since November 14, Western Australia has received 30,389 interstate arrivals in total under the controlled border regime. 28,006 travellers by air and 2,383 travellers by road. Of the total arrivals, 6,670 people have been required to self-quarantine for 14 days. These have been predominantly Victorian and New South Wales arrivals who have been permitted to enter WA but required to self-quarantine and take a COVID test. WA Police also advise that over the same period, they have conducted 62,461 physical checks of people being in self-quarantine. WA Police have found that the overwhelming majority of people understand and have been complying with their obligations, either through the use of the G2G Now technology or from direct police checks. Last Tuesday, we announced, based on the latest health advice, that New South Wales and Victoria could both transition to a very low risk state under our controlled border. That transition would occur on Tuesday, the 8th of December. Unfortunately, just one day later, New South Wales recorded a case of COVID-19 from a person who worked in their hotel quarantine system. As a result, we took a decision to carefully monitor the situation in New South Wales before giving the final go-ahead on the updated border controls. All through this pandemic, I've made it crystal clear that Western Australians will take, sorry, all through the pandemic, I've made it crystal clear that Western Australia will take a considered, cautious, careful approach to our decision-making. Our extra cautious approach has worked. We've kept COVID out, protecting people's lives. And Western Australia's economy has roared back to life as a result, faster than we ever expected. We have come so far here in WA, there is no point in taking unnecessary risks that put all our good work to waste. Over the last few days, we have watched what has occurred in New South Wales like a hawk. Our Chief Health Officer has provided us with regular briefings on the situation over there. This morning, he provided myself, the Health Minister and the Police Commissioner with an up-to-date assessment of the situation. Prior to this hotel quarantine worker case, New South Wales had a run of 26 consecutive days of no community cases. Genome sequencing of this case has confirmed it has come from an American strain, not from the local community in Sydney. That's very positive news. However, to ensure this case hadn't caused a local outbreak in Sydney, we watched the testing regime very closely. 
Close personal work and travel contacts of this case were identified, tested and quarantined under New South Wales health arrangements. It is very pleasing to know that no further cases have been identified over the last five days. Therefore, with no additional cases in New South Wales over the last 30 days, the Chief Health Officer has recommended that the risk of importation of COVID-19 from New South Wales is now very low. As a result, it is safe to continue our plans as announced and to transition New South Wales to the next classification. This will occur for both Victoria and New South Wales, effective from midnight tonight. These states will join the ACT, Queensland, Northern Territory and Tasmania as very low risk jurisdictions. As of tomorrow, travel is permitted to WA from these states with the following conditions under our control border. Travellers must complete a G2G pass declaration, stipulating they do not have any COVID-19 symptoms and which jurisdictions they have been in over the previous 14 days, including if they have knowingly come in contact with someone from South Australia. All Perth ar airport arrivals must undergo a health screening and temperature test on arrival. Travellers must be prepared to take a COVID-19 test at the airport COVID clinic, if deemed necessary by a health clinician. In addition, all land arrivals will be met at the border checkpoint for a health screening and to have their G2G pass declaration checked. The 14 days of self-quarantine requirement will no longer be required from tomorrow. With Victoria and New South Wales now falling into line with other Australian jurisdictions except South Australia. I want to acknowledge and thank everyone for their, for their patience and understanding, not only in the last week but over the course of the whole year. While our border controls have been one of our most effective weapons in the fight against the virus, they have come with consequences for many families. But the good news is, with confidence and on the basis of the best health advice, we can now take this next cautious and safe step forward. Thank you for your patience and understanding while we, whilst we cautiously assess the situation over the last few days. I also can provide an update on South Australia. The outbreak in South Australia was significant and our moves to reintroduce the hard border were deemed to be the best response. South Australia is currently classified as a medium risk state, which effectively gives rise to the hard border. Only those very few people exempted are permitted to enter WA from South Australia. The Chief Health Officer has also updated his advice in relation to our South Australian border controls. South Australia have now gone nine days with no community cases. After extensive testing and quarantining of contacts, South Australia now has a 14-day rolling case average of less than one case. As a result, effective from midnight on Thursday night or 0001 AM on Friday, December 11, South Australia will move to the low risk category. Of course, this is pending no subsequent outbreaks in that state. For travellers from South Australia or anyone who has been in South Australia in the previous 14 days, they will be permitted to enter WA. However, they will be required to comply with these conditions. Travellers must complete a G2G pass declaration. Travellers must take a COVID-19 test at the airport COVID clinic if deemed necessary by a health clinician. They must self-quarantine for 14 days in a suitable approved premise, and they must present for a COVID test on day 11. It is important to note that if you're driving through South Australia from another state over east, you will be required to follow the same conditions of travel as someone living in South Australia. These cautious and safe steps are, positive, are a positive move for our state and our nation. But like I've said before, I will not hesitate in bringing back the hard border if that is what is required. Our border controls have always and will continue to be in place on health advice. This is something I can guarantee as we, that is something I can guarantee as we move forward on our COVID journey. The response to COVID across the country has been something we should all take pride in. Australia is very close to eliminating 
the virus locally. But we won't get complacent, and that's why our control border measures will remain in place for the time being. They are a, a unique Western Australian arrangement to keep our state safe and strong, and to continue our 239-day stretch of no local cases of COVID-19. But I repeat, if we have any concerns with future outbreaks in the East, then subject to health advice, we can put the hard border back up immediately and we won't hesitate to do so. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Have you had any, um, obviously now the, the gates are open, um, any preliminary indication from, from the eastern states uh, on flights and how that will all be put back together how, and how quickly it can be stitched back together? Well, uh, we made the announcement, uh, whichever day it was, uh, a week or so ago, uh, that we were transitioning to uh, a controlled border for New South Wales and Victoria on December 8. And I understand airlines started making preparations and plans on that basis. So I would expect they were still um, working on the basis of December 8. Obviously, the New South Wales case uh, made us reconsider, but I would expect they're still working on the basis of December 8. I'd encourage the airlines to make sure that uh, their flights are affordable uh, and uh, not to gouge customers. Uh, and obviously, uh, the consumers of Australia won't appreciate it if uh, that sort of conduct does take place. But um, we had to reconsider. We had to have a look at uh, the situation in New South Wales. Uh, every day, uh, New South Wales is doing 12 to 14,000 tests, in particular in the areas from which uh, this uh, uh, lady uh, that acquired the virus was from, and they haven't had a positive, and they had a, haven't had a positive from any of her relatives that they tested. So. Uh, on the basis of health advice, uh, we were confident in taking the decision we've taken today. And Premier, also, um, in terms of testing, we don't do testing here for people who are exhibiting um, flu-like symptoms or COVID-like symptoms. Now that the border's coming, as I understand it, now the border's coming down, is, is that likely to be ramped up, testing? <coughs> or we test for all symptomatic people at the moment. Yeah. yeah. So we're testing between about thirteen and 15,000 people a week at the moment? through our COVID clinics and through uh, mm. the private pathology. Yeah, we, we do a large amount of testing. We haven't done as much testing as the other states because our population is smaller. Uh, we've had no COVID and we've had barely any flu. In fact, uh, the advice I have is basically zero flu. Uh, so we haven't had as many people presenting as they have in the East. There's a few travellers out there saying, why, why did it take five days to confirm today's announcement right on the eve of um, the scheduled reopening. Like, did you need those full five days? It couldn't have been done any sooner. Because we're very cautious and uh, we're very safe. Uh, and we had to see if there was any outbreaks in New South Wales or Victoria over that period. Uh, so I think what we've done was very wise and very safe. And I think the vast majority of people would understand that. Any Victorians who are currently in um, hotel quarantine, will they be allowed to walk free? No. No, people will need to complete their quarantining. Uh, they will be in uh, self-quarantine. Uh, the hotels are now uh, for overseas travellers returning to Australia, except in exceptional circumstances. So people from Victoria and New South Wales who are, and, you know, basically people from Victoria and New South Wales who are currently in um, uh, quarantine, uh, they'll need to complete their quarantine in accordance with the rules uh, under which they entered the state. Do you know how many uh, G2G registrations there have been from New South Wales and Victoria? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I don't have that figure with me. Uh, well, we can see if we can get that. Yeah. How relieved are you that this is the news you can give those in New South Wales and Victoria and reunited families at this stage for Christmas? Well, I'm happy for those people who want to come, and I've had a range of people raise it with me around the community. Their daughter's coming back from Melbourne or Sydney. Uh, their, uh, you know, their parents are able to come and visit for Christmas and I'm happy for all of those people. Uh, this will be a happy day for them. Um, but I just repeat, um, everything we have done along the last uh, nine months has been on the basis of keeping our state safe. Uh, obviously, because we have a control border and no other state has a control border, we can put the hard border back up immediately if the health advice indicates that's the appropriate course. Uh, and whilst that is sort of a, um, 
so a, a, a capacity we have, obviously that will make a few people nervous that that could happen at any point in time. But then again, COVID is unpredictable and you don't know what might happen. You don't know when there might be a mistake in a hotel in Sydney or Brisbane or, or the like uh, that requires us to do that. So uh, we just, um, we'll just continue to be safe and take a cautious approach. But for those families reuniting at Christmas, I'm happy for them. If there is um, a sudden cluster somewhere around the country, how long, how long before you reacted to it? Would you give it a chance to sort of have a look and see what happens with it? So it might be a week or a week and a half or whatever, or would it be the next day up goes the borders? Depends on the circumstances, as we've already had an experience like this, which was South Australia. So uh, when the South Australian outbreak happened there a few weeks ago, uh, we had a meeting of the emergency committee um, with uh, the health minister, myself, the chief health officer, the police commissioner, the public sector commissioner and the like. We had a meeting within a couple of hours and we made a decision to reinstate the hard border within, uh, within a few hours. So uh, if necessary, we can act very, very quickly um, and uh, we can reinstate the hard border very easily. The reason we can do it more easily than any other state is we will retain people on the border uh, in Eucla and Kununurra. We will re retain staff at the airport uh, dealing with the G2G pass applications under the control border. So we need to increase the border arrangements to become a hard border again. We can do it basically instantaneously. And that's uh, the beauty of our system. Uh, our system is far more careful, far more precautionary. It's unique to Western Australia. Other states don't have it. Uh, but if we need to, uh, we can toughen up our rules in a heartbeat. Would you ever consider just blocking certain postcodes in certain states or would you be more inclined to well, we haven't done the postcode arrangement because it's very difficult to enforce and you never know where, who has been through a certain postcode. So we've dealt more with states because we always thought that was an easier way and a more um, understandable way to deal with uh, the situation that confronted us. So we've never gone for the hotspot model at this point in time. Uh, we go more for the state model and I think it's been far more easily understood and it's obviously worked. Uh, if you have a look at... Um, New South Wales, Tasmania, Victoria, South Australia and Queensland, they've all had outbreaks. They've all had outbreaks. Uh, Western Australia has not. Uh, so our border arrangements have worked. We wouldn't be making this change unless we were completely reassured that it was safe. And we have been reassured that it's safe. But obviously, if the situation changes over east and they have further outbreaks, well then we can reinstate the hard border in an instant. The police commissioner was reflecting a couple of weeks ago, I think, on the lack of information flow, or certainly not as he would like it, from the airlines, from the Sturgeon. Um, do you know whether that, whether that information flow has improved and that, that therefore you have some, a, a take better comfort from that? No, we, we, we don't. I don't have that advice to hand, um, and, but obviously I'll, I'll, um, I can follow up and find out. Uh, obviously the police commission was looking for manifests. And we have requested the Commonwealth work with us on this. I think it's basically an issue of Commonwealth regulation that would allow for manifests so that we get to know who's coming from another state. Partly it's a COVID issue, but I think it's also partly uh, finding out if any, um, you know, uh, crime figures uh, might be arriving in the state. Uh, so that's, um, that's why uh, the police commissioner is keen on it. We've supported him. I put it on the national cabinet agenda. Uh, I was hoping for a report back by now, but I can't recall if one has arrived or not. Can you recall, Roger? No, no, okay. With, with the changes for South Australia um, on Friday, if somebody were to drive from Victoria or New South Wales via South Australia and arrive at Nuclear, would they still have to self-quarantine for 14 days? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, and again, on, on South Australia, so they've gone nine days with no new cases. Uh, so they need to get to 28 days. That basically takes them to Christmas Day. Um, is there any hope? that you could bring that forward and open to South Australia before Christmas Day rather than leaving it the day off? Uh, we'll take medical advice on that as to which date is appropriate, but uh, our normal rule is 28 days before it's considered. So we'll just um, seek the advice of the ch Chief Health Officer. I know it's a bit hard for people from South Australia uh, and people who transit through South Australia, uh, but uh, you know we've had rules that have kept ourselves and our state safe. So uh, we'll just continue to follow those rules and that precautionary approach. Well I, well, I don't actively encourage people to travel uh, to New South Wales, Victoria. I encourage people to have holidays in Western Australia. 
uh, and to enjoy and uh, spend their money here. But if people choose to go to New South Wales or Victoria to visit family or to have a holiday or whatever it might be, uh, that is their choice. I just warn everyone that when you travel into a state, there is a risk that at some point in time, if there is an outbreak, we have to put up a hard border. Now, when it happened in South Australia, there a few weeks ago, we provided a compassion, compassionate exemption for West Australians wanting to return home who had travelled, uh, subject to uh, testing and the like, uh, but uh, we provided that compassionate exemption. So that was the, the arrangement we put in place for South Australia. It may well be, depending upon any outbreak, that that's the system we would put in place for another state. But I just, just urge people, if you want to travel east, um, for Christmas to see your family, uh, you will be able to, with the exception of, at this point in time, South Australia. But uh, bear in mind, um, there's always the prospect, depending upon any safety concerns, that the hard border might come up again. Uh, Tasmania taking their first uh, international arrivals today. Um, they've announced that uh, their government is going to provide a wage supplement to hotel quarantine guards so that they don't take second jobs. Melbourne are doing something mm. similar. Uh, are you considering such a move to reduce the risk? We are looking at those sorts of initiatives at this point in time. Uh, our ho hotel quarantine system has worked very well and the arrangement we've had in place has worked extremely well. Uh, but they're the sorts of things we're currently considering. What else are you considering? Because we're seeing South Australia and Melbourne completely overhauling how they conduct hotel quarantine from air ventilation to putting uh, active cases on certain floors of hotels. We haven't seen any of that in WA. Well, what changes are you considering? We made a range of changes other states have followed. I'll give you a few. Um, first of all, we've required uh, cleaners and security in hotels to uh, get mandatory testing every seven days. So other states haven't done that. Some states are now following that. Secondly, uh, with maritime crews coming into Western Australia to board ships, we put them in hotels. Uh, other states didn't. They have them out in sort of in the community, if you like, quarantining in sort of apartments or the like. We put them in hotels. For flight crew coming in, uh, we put them all in a hotel. Um, we didn't allow them just to stay where they feel like. So uh, we've done things that other states haven't done. And we've put in place more secure arrangements uh, with all of those categories uh, than other states have. Uh, so, look, we'll continue to monitor. We're looking at those sorts of initiatives. Obviously, um, we've got a hotel quarantine arrangements that have worked very well. So we don't want to just suddenly say, disrupt it all. But if we can mend to uh, make it better, they're the sorts of arrangements we'll look at. Uh, Roger might be able to comment when I finish. Um, I think on Friday you're also getting advice about New Zealand. Is that correct? That was in the last uh, written advice from the uh, yeah, to, uh, I, my advice is it's. It, uh, I'd have to get you some advice on that, Peter. But it may, may be another. Roger might know another two weeks. Can I just ask a non-COVID question? Uh, we've seen the release come out about Parliament being prorogued. Um, I think you had about fifty or sixty bills that were introduced by the government that never passed. They included puppy farming, farm trespass, ticket scalping. They're all big headlines at the mm. time. Did you overpromise and underdeliver? Uh, no, uh, we've been a very, very proactive government in reforming the laws, and we've had a huge agenda over the course of the f last four years. Uh, but Parliament's always prorogued uh, in December, and so we just followed the normal uh, traditional arrangements with these things. Um, part of the problem, of course, and you're political journalists, you'll know this better than anyone, is uh, the upper house is often a big roadblock. So our legislation will hit there, and uh, the, uh, the Liberal Party and in particular, we'll just talk and talk and talk and try and frustrate the government's agenda. So even good things like those ones, ticket scalping, puppy farming, uh, animal welfare laws, they will just talk and talk and talk and delay them. But obviously they're drafted. If the government is re-elected, we will re reintroduce those laws. They're important laws. Uh, and uh, if we're re-elected, we'd love to see them pass. Um, can I just ask your Premier, the Liberals have announced a new election policy about cutting payroll tax well firstly we've already cut payroll tax twice so over the term of this government we've already uh, made life better especially for the smaller end uh, twice with payroll tax cuts uh, but the most important thing I think for business across the state is that we have a robust secure economy and we currently have the most successful economy in the nation because we kept COVID out and we're, we're able to reopen 
businesses far more quickly than any other state in Australia. So, uh, and our model, it has worked. Uh, obviously, the Liberal Party wanted to open the borders. They supported Clive Palmer. Uh, that, of course, uh, would have um, potentially meant the virus came back in and it would have been disastrous. So I think our record is there for all to see. The rent um, moratorium on the COVID, is that run its course now, do you think? Well, it expires I, from memory about March 28. Uh, so it will, uh, it will proceed until then. Uh, I think uh, we made an announcement a couple of months ago that at that point in time, barring uh, any economic cataclysm, uh, it, would, uh, it, it would end at that point in time. Well, it's also, you know, it's a benefit. It, it, it's a, the benefit of it is it provides certainty for everyone. And we're very concerned about mass evictions uh, during the course of this year. So we just provided certainty for everyone. We've made sure people who were struggling uh, were protected as best we can. Uh, it was designed to last a year. We don't plan to change that. Thank you very much. Do you want to add anything, Roger? Oh, I'm sorry, I have to go to a school graduation, so I'll have to uh, back out. Thanks, everyone. It's that time of the year when school graduations are, take over everything. Uh, so just going back to your earlier point, Jeff, uh, so we continue to test people uh, who are symptomatic. Uh, anyone who is symptomatic can get a test through either any of our COVID clinics, the Commonwealth funded respiratory clinics, or by referral from a GP to a, to a private pathology lab. As I said, we're, we're testing between 13 and 15,000 people a week at the moment. But regardless of what we do with the, um, with the uh, borders, it remains an important message to the community that if you are unwell, you should get yourself tested and stay away from school, stay away from work. And, and on, um, on QR codes, <coughs> how, how long is the government prepared to sort of have a light hand on, on businesses and, and um, patrons who don't comply with, with, um, with QR requirements? Yeah, well, our mandatory uh, uh, contact registers came in on the uh, on the fifth of December on Saturday, and and uh, as we've observed all the way along, sometimes new arrangements take a little bit of getting used to. I think the the level of un of consciousness amongst businesses and the community now is significantly higher than it was even just a few days ago. So you can. Um, we, we'll be uh, expecting our um, environmental health officers that, um, occup that work within each of the local government's jurisdictions to start making that an, an important part of their ongoing liaison and inspections of, of all uh, hospitality venues. Look, we don't want to be heavy handed about any of this. Uh, one of the secrets of Western Australia's success has been the way that it's uh, embraced all the measures that we've need to take place. And that's been a great credit to the WA community. So we don't expect to have to be heavy handed handed in relation to contact registers. So there's been no fines for non-compliance so far? Not so far, no. Um, just on uh, my question about uh, change of the hotel quarantine in other states, they seem to be kind of yeah. addressing the weakness <coughs> in the system. Um, the Premier said he's looking at continuing wage supplement for security guards. Uh, can you just expand on when you might see that and what other measures you're looking at introducing to improve hotel quarantine? Well, as the Premier said, our hotel quarantines worked very well. Uh, we were one of the first jurisdictions to bring the health and welfare services in-house. So previously, most jurisdictions outsource that to a, to a private contractor. Uh, we've got, uh, we made sure that each of our uh, security personnel that we utilised had specialised training in infection protection control. And, and as a result of that, I think our hotel quarantine has, has worked very well. Uh, it's interesting conversations with the health minister in New South Wales. They're now going to copy out the model we have in relation to um, international air crew. And, uh, and uh, I think all the states uh, are looking at each other to see how we can continue to improve. We've asked the department to, to have a look at all the arrangements. And, and obviously we've been uh, provided some feedback from the Holton Review, which looked at all the hotel quarantining arrangements around the country. Uh, and our, our arrangements were considered pretty, uh, pretty watertight and in some cases uh, too tight. And, um, but uh, we'll continue to learn from those things. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks,